Well, let's uh, let's get started with a word of prayer. By the way, Joe, thank you for getting us all together again. Yeah. That's always the right thing to do. So, Father, uh, we're grateful for this day, and uh, we understand the time change, and that affects uh, uh, some folks, and, and that's understandable. It's affected me in times past, so uh, I'm sure it's affected some of our other folks this morning. But we're here, and uh, we're waiting on you to have your way with our life. So use your word this morning in our lives in a wonderful way, in Christ's name, for his sake. Amen. Uh, last Thursday night at the Bible study, and uh, we're having a good time, don't you think? We uh, really, we, we took the word of God and imparted knowledge, but emphasized the fact that you don't want to just take this knowledge and not apply it. The whole idea behind coming to church or going to a Bible study or having your own personal devotions is, is not to gather knowledge, but to actually gather knowledge to apply, which gives you wisdom. Well, we're, we're going to talk about such a subject here this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, that, that old uh, spiritual song, Ezekiel had the wheel way up in the middle of the sky. Ezekiel, hey, I love that song. It's an old uh, Negro spiritual, if you would, and it's a great one. Um, Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, that would have been the 30th year of Ezekiel. We know that all of the priests that ever were, were called into service didn't start their service until they were 30 years old. And so God waited for Ezekiel, the prophet and priest, to write this book until he came of age. It says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, that the Hebrew fourth month is July. Our fourth month is uh, January, February, March, April. <laughs> but the uh, Hebrew month here is July. It says, And in the fifth day, or July 5th, the year would have been 592 B.C., or 592 years before the time of Christ. He says, As I was among the captives by the river Jabbar over in Babylon, because he was taken captive, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. God took Ezekiel, allowed him to be brought into captivity. By the way, Daniel was taken before Ezekiel was. And then Jeremiah, of course, was left back home. Jeremiah would have been Ezekiel's preacher. Jeremiah would have also been Daniel's preacher. But we have two preachers, Ezekiel and Daniel, over in captivity in Babylon. And we have Jeremiah back in Jerusalem holding down the fort, if you would. It says, while he was sitting there by the river Chabar in Babylon, the Bible says God gave Ezekiel three visions. And they were all of God. He saw three different visions of God that morning, and all three visions dealt with Christ. I don't know if you know that. The first vision was the vision of the four creatures, and I want you to note that real quick, Ezekiel 1, 4, and 5. Uh, verse 4 says, And I, Ezekiel, looked, and behold, as I was sitting by the river Jabbar, he said, A whirlwind, or a tornado, if you would, came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And also, now catch this, and also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. These four creatures, according to Ezekiel chapter 10, are angels. You say, what kind of angels? I'm glad you asked that question. The Bible defines what kind of angels those four living creatures were that Ezekiel saw in his vision concerning Christ. They're cherubims. You say, what? Yeah, they're cherubims. You say, are there different kinds of angels? Yes, there are. But these were cherubims. Ezekiel 10.20 says this, This is the living creature, Ezekiel said, that I saw under the God of Israel by the river Chabar, and I knew they were cherubims. Cherubims are those class of angels whose job it is to guard the work of God. Now, you've got to catch all this. 
These four cherubims in particular stand before God the Father as a constant reminder of Christ's work that was completed for us at Calvary. Thus, the vision of the four creatures is all about a vision of Christ in his life and work in the four Gospels. You see, in the Bible, there are two class of angels. Three, I guess, if you would count archangels. But basically, two class of angels. And their jobs are completely different from one another. Cherubims, seraphims. Remember those two names. Those are the two class of angels that run around this world unseen even as we speak. Cherubims mean to till or to plow. They deal with work. Are two to four winged angels whose job it is to guard the work of God. These were the angels that guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden once humans were kicked out of it. Remember Genesis 3 and verse 24? I'll read that for you. So he, God, drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. By the way, cherubims are also those angels that hover over the mercy seat. If you ever got a, a, a view of the mercy seat and how it was uh, uh, created, you, you had this, this Ark of the Covenant, you had this mercy seat on top, and you had these two angels hovering over it. These are cherubims. They're not seraphims. You say, what's the difference? We're going to get to that here in just a little bit. It says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5, and over it, that is, over the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. So now watch. Cherubims are that order of angels that march century around the work of God. The work of God in the garden. The work of God over the mercy seat and redemption. They're the ones that just constantly march century and guard the work of God. Just remember, important. it's important to remember that. Cherubims not only protected God's work in the Garden of Eden, they also protected God's work that Christ completed for us on the cross. And that's what the mercy seat is all about. We know what cherubims do. The question is, what do seraphims do? Whereas the word cherubim means to till or to plow, and were created to guard the work of God, the word seraphim means burning ones. Seraphims are not two to four winged angels. They're six winged angels. And two of their wings will cover their face. Two of their wings will cover their feet. And the other two on their back are used for flying. Seraphims are angels who were created by God, now watch this, by God, to guard the holiness of God. One guards the work of God, uh, of God, which is uh, cherubims. The other one guards the holiness of God, which is seraphims. Remember we were talking about Isaiah chapter 6 last week? Go ahead and turn there again, real quick. Turn there, because I'm going to introduce you to seraphims. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, we talked about that last week, I, Ezekiel, saw also the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, not cherubims, seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. By the way, seraphims cover their faces with one set of wings because of the holiness of God. They don't want to look directly at God because of how holy He is. They are in the very presence of God. And they protect His holiness and they prove it by covering their own faces as they do so. The covering of their faces before God denotes their deep reverence for God and allows them to veil their view of God seeing He is so holy. Wouldn't that be nice if we did that? 
Wouldn't it be nice if we acted more like seraphims than cherubims? You know, we're all about the work of God. We're all about busy doing things for God. Uh, but here's these seraphims built directly to guard the holiness of God. The covering of their feet with the other set of wings denotes their humility before God. Meaning they're humble enough not to run around and politic before the other angels. You say, politic? Angels politic? <laughs> the angels were the ones who created politics. You say, no, they didn't. We did in America. <laughs> First of all, politics aren't uh, just in America, they're all over the world. But the human beings aren't the first ones that came up with politics. The originator of politics are the angels. These seraphims are so humble, they don't run around and politic before the other angels. That's why they cover their feet. You say, I didn't know Satan ran around politicking. How do you think he got a third of the angels to follow him? <laughs> Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Let's look at this real quick. Ezekiel 28 and verse 15. In describing Satan here, God says of Satan in verse 15, Thou, Satan, was perfect in thy ways from the day that I created you till iniquity was found in you, Satan. Notice verse 17. Thy heart was lifted up, O Lucifer, because of thy beauty, thy charm, if you would. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness or thy intellect or intelligence, because he was the most charming, beautiful, intelligent angel God ever created. In fact, the other two archangels wouldn't have anything to do in fighting him, meaning Michael and Gabriel kind of fell back before, before Lucifer. He said, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Now, now here it is. Catch this. Verse 18. Thou, Satan, hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy, what's the next word? Traffic. You see, you mean, you mean that stuff out on the boulevard? Traffic? No. <laughs> this word traffic is a Hebrew word meaning to go up and down as a tail bearer or secret agitator. The same word is used in Leviticus 19.16, Proverbs 20.19, and Jeremiah 6.28. The word literally means to campaign, to lobby, to politic. What God accused Lucifer of was politicking here, of saying whatever he had to say amongst the other angels in order to be followed. <laughs> the seraphim say, listen, we, we don't want to be a part of any kind of politicking, so we're not going to be running around and do that, and we're covering our feet. That's the whole reason one set of wings cover their feet. Politics are and always will be of the devil. Always. Where do you think political correctness comes from? Like politics, political <laughs> correctness will never correct anything. Why? Because it cannot change us. Political correctness can't change any of us. It can only pressure us to tolerate one another for a while. There's only one thing that can change and correct a human being, and that's God's word in the gospel. Would to God America got back to that. Sadly, due to politics, America has gotten rid of the only thing that can change and correct her, which is the word of God's word. Dennis Prager, American syndicated columnist, author, and public speaker, once said, listen to this, if we continue to teach about tolerance and intolerance instead of good and evil, we will end up with the tolerance of evil. That's what you're seeing in America today. In other words, what Prager was saying was if we continue to focus our attention on likable and unlikable things people happen to say instead of lessons in life to be learned, we will end up ignoring that which will keep us from evil. Hutton Gibson, 
Father of Mel Gibson once said, tolerance is the last virtue of a depraved society. When an immoral society has blatantly and proudly violated all the commandments of God, it insists upon one last virtue, tolerance for its immorality. It will not tolerate condemnation of its perversions. It creates a whole new world in which only the intolerant critic of an intolerable evil is evil. So the reason the seraphims cover their feet with one set of wings is to remind them not to run around and politic. Oh, that's a sad thing. Politics are even in church. I've been saved long enough to know that. You say, why? Because people take their feet and run to everybody else about stuff. Now note what Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Note what he saw. It says in one of the seraphims, cried unto another and said, with two wings over their face, two wings over their feet, and two wings on their back to fly, they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And with that announcement, this is what happened. Verse 4. And the tabernacle moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Meaning, watch this. After the cry of that one seraphim, who said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, Isaiah was allowed to see all the way into the tabernacle, past the holy place, past the veil, into the holy of holies, and the Shekinah glory. You say, well, what's, what's so odd about that? Isaiah wasn't a priest. Only priests were allowed into the temple. He was just a prophet. Remember King Uzziah? Remember last week? He went into the temple. He wasn't allowed in the temple. Well, neither was Isaiah. But Isaiah, because of that announcement of how holy God is, God allowed, he pulled back the curtains, if you would, and allowed Isaiah to see right through the holy place, past the veil, into the holy of holies. Verse 6. As soon as Isaiah saw it, he said, Then said I, Woe is who? Me. Me. Totally broken. By the way, no bitterness. Brokenness. Whenever a Christian is actually allowed to see the holiness of God, and that's what the seraphims deal with all the time. He or she is cut to the heart immediately. Woe is me. Not woe is all my brothers and sisters in Christ around me. Boy, you're all in trouble. I just saw the holiness of God. You're all in trouble. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's woe is me. If you truly see the holiness of God. Brokenness is the result of truly seeing God's holiness. So when Christians appear to act all holy, but there's no brokenness, then it isn't holiness at all. It's a self-righteousness. And that's how you tell the difference. If you see somebody who is bitter, it's self-righteousness. It's not holiness. Holiness only creates brokenness. So now, catch this. One class of angels guards the work of God, cherubims. The other class of angels guards the holiness of God, seraphims. Which class of angels did Satan belong to? In case you don't know that, I'm going to tell you. He belonged to the cherubims, not the seraphims. He belonged to that class of angels which always guarded the work of God. Not the holiness of God. The work. Meaning it was a group of cherubims, not seraphims, who rebelled against God and fell. 
that group that guards the mercy seat, the work of God concerning redemption, that, that group that guarded the Garden of Eden, the work of God to begin with for man. <clears throat> Anytime the work of God is involved, cherubims are involved. Well, that was the order that Satan was a part of. He wasn't a part of the seraphims. He was part of the cherubims. By the way, there's a great lesson to be learned by all of this. The angels who rebelled were the ones who guarded the work of God, not the holiness of God. Meaning, our duty to God, our work for Him. What I do, this is my work for Him. I get up and I preach. What you do, you, you get up and you sing. What, what David does or, or Robert does, gets up and serves. And the rest of you that have your duties. Our duty to God is never as important as our devotion to God. Never. In other words, time with God is more important than time for God. Good luck getting Christians to do that. Daily devotions with God are more important than a once a week service in which we sing fellowship with believers, give, teach, and serve, etc., etc. That's the great lesson here. It's great to work for God, duty. But that often gets us in trouble. Because we get to thinking, hey, we're all that in a bag of chips. Whereas the seraphims, they covered their face because God was so holy. They're in the very presence of God. And they understand His holiness. Not his justice, his holiness. Holiness is the difference between God and every one of his creations, including angels. He is completely different than all. So how is he different than we are? Well, let me see. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Are the angels all-powerful? Are humans all-powerful? He's completely omnipresent. He's here and in another church and on the other side of the universe, universe at the same time. Can angels do that? Can we do that? He's omniscient. He knows everything. We think we know everything. Satan thought he knew everything. But they don't. This is, the, this is what holiness is. Holiness is the difference between God and us. He's loving. You say, well, I'm loving every now and then. <laughs> Not the kind of love he loves. His is agape love. Yours is for Lego. Mine is for Lego. Oh, I, I show mercy on people. That's human mercy. Completely different than the mercy of God. See, his moral and his natural attributes define who he is, and we as humans and angels have none of those attributes. None. Zero. Nada. And we never will. You say, wait a minute. Didn't the book of Hebrews tell us that you know, without holiness we shall not see God. Yeah, that's true. Well, see, we can do holiness, but that's not what it's talking about. You can't do holiness. I can't do holiness. I don't have those attributes. But the one who lives inside of me has those attributes. When I got saved, the Holy Spirit who has all those attributes lives inside of me. And if I yield to Him, that, that <laughs> attribute of Love can come out. That attribute of mercy can come out. That attribute of, of truth can come out. But I've got to let the one who has those attributes do it. So we really have nothing here. Last scripture. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Familiar ground to all of us, or it should be. This is the story of Mary and Martha. One was dedicated to duty. The other one was dedicated to devotion. One was a cherubim, if you would be. The other was a seraphim. Let's see which one Jesus bragged on the most. Verse 38, Now it came to pass as they went that Jesus entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. See that, see that devotion to the Word? That, no, by, by the way, that devotion to the Word who's Christ. Mary says, the Word 
The everlasting word, the living word is in our house. <laughs> she dropped everything she was doing. She dropped all her duty, full jobs, everything, and sat at Jesus' feet. Martha, on the other hand, the one who invited him into their home, said, oh my goodness, we've we got to do everything here to serve you. Jesus says, I, I, I really don't want your duty as much as I want your devotion. Get the message? Verse 40, But Martha was covered about much with much serving and came to Jesus and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? She's not doing a thing for you. All she's doing is sitting here listening to you. <laughs> Bid her therefore that she help me. By the way, this is the problem with, with working for God. We think everybody else ought to work for God too. And when they're not, we're critical of them. We take our little feet. We're not seraphims here, we're cherubims. We're the order of bad angels that go around and guard the work of God. We think everyone else ought to be doing what we're doing. No, my goal, for as long as I'm alive, and wherever I preach, is to get the people of God to become devoted to God. Not devoted to a church, not devoted to, to a work. No, no, no. Not that those things aren't important, but to get devoted to Him. To make sure everything we're learning, we're applying to our life. We'll take a message like this this morning and you say, you know what? There's truth in that message. If there is, then we ought to live it. Not just learn it. And Jesus, verse 41, answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. By the way, anytime Jesus says something twice, Anytime God ever says anything twice in Scripture, He says, I need your attention on this. He said to Martha, 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 thou art careful and troubled about many things. And not only that, you're taking it so far, you're criticizing your sister who's devoted to me about it. He said, verse 42, but one thing is needful, and you didn't choose it. You chose duty. Your sister Mary chose devotion. And the Bible says, <laughs> which shall not be taken away from her, because that's the good part. There's nothing wrong with serving God. We should all do it. But that shouldn't be our number one priority. Why? Because that can get us in trouble. That'll put us in the cherubim realm, where we can get so busy for God <laughs> Then we begin to get critical of others that aren't so busy. I don't care if you're busy for God or you're not. I'm only going to try to get you to get devoted to God. I'm going to get you to be a part of that seraphim order. Because when you're guarding the holiness of God, not the work of God, the holiness of God, you cover your feet. You're so humble. You haven't got a critical eye about anybody. It's woe is me, not woe is everybody else. You see the difference? So always take a message that you hear, be it on Thursday night, be it in your own devotions every day of the, the, the week, be it on Sunday. Take it and don't learn it. Live it. You say, well, what did I learn here this morning? You learned not to be a cherubim. It's okay to work for God, but that shouldn't be your greatest focus. Your greatest focus and my greatest focus ought to be the seraphim attitude. Total devotion to God. He's so holy, we understand that. And it humbles us to the place where we ain't going to talk about anybody or anything. All we want to do is be totally devoted to God because of how different He is than us. By the way, think about how different the angels are than we are. You got wings? I know if you drink that bowl thing, you got wings, you know. But other than that, you got wings? 
<laughs> no. You can you live in another dimension like they do? No, we're we're stuck here for a moment. And yet the Bible says when you and I get our we'll catch this, when you and I get our new resurrected bodies one of these days, we're gonna be greater than even the angels. We won't need wings to get from one place to the next. Say, what do you need? Blink of an eye. I want to be on the other part of the universe. Blink your eye, you're there. Like that. I want to be in another universe God created that I know nothing about. Blink of an eye, and you're there. You, you don't need wings to take you there. And not only that, your body is completely different than the angelic body. Yours will actually shine like the stars. Hopefully, like one of the brighter stars. <laughs> Whereas theirs is a constant brightness all the time. It doesn't change. Ours changes. Seraphim, the ones in Isaiah chapter 6, those are the ones you want to be like. They're not the ones that rebelled against God. They didn't have a revolt. Why? Because they, they are totally devoted to God. They didn't run for God, for, from God. They're, they're always running to God. And when they run to God, their face is covered and their feet are covered, letting God know that His very presence, His very attributes that are different than theirs, different than ours, is what keeps us totally devoted to Him. Don't, don't be like the cherubims of which Satan was a part of that order. Don't be like the seraphims and guard the holiness of God more than you guard the work of God. Let's pray here. Father, thank you again for another opportunity to impart truth. Lord, it's what we do with the truth that matters. It doesn't matter if we gain a bunch of knowledge. What matters is what we do with that knowledge. So Lord, we learned this morning that it's more important to have devotions, personal devotions every day of our life than it is to come to church once a week and sit underneath preaching and singing. The question is, is will we do that? Will we take the time to be more devoted to the holiness of God than we are the work of God? In Christ's name, amen.